All right. Well, speaking of heart touching, the title of our message is It's a Matter of the Heart, Romans uh, 2. So as we continue in uh, our study in Romans, and again, the introduction was the first 17 verses, Paul introducing himself to a group of believers that he had a heart for, wanted to see, but had been hindered uh, to coming, uh, believed that once he did come, he would be uh, a blessing to them. He hoped through the teaching of the Word of God, exercising his that particular spiritual gift, uh, but uh, he believed, the apostle, that they would be a blessing, and he would learn and, uh, from them as well. He uh, then begins to lay out, again, a series of these very important uh, doctrinal statements about what it is to really be a Christian, what it is that we believe, uh, and in doing so, uh, that first principle, we're calling them principles of righteousness, uh, the first one is the condemnation. Of, of really everybody. Everybody needs to be saved. And he looked at the, the run-of-the-mill uh, uh, heathen, pagan, idol worshiper, people that could care less about God, uh, that have maybe never heard the name of Jesus, never heard the gospel, uh, and they could say they think maybe uh, that, uh, well, maybe I've done some good things that outweighed my bad things. Uh, they could say, well, I never had the opportunity that, uh, that you had to hear the gospel and so forth, so certainly God will not hold me accountable like he will you. And Paul says, no, all men are without excuse. And, uh, and we've tried to use, certainly, as Paul's giving us answers, he kind of puts up these rhetorical questions, uh, what about this? And then he answers it so often, it's, uh, I think, hopefully helping us get those answers ourselves for those that we're trying to share our faith with. And, uh, and we've already seen a couple important ones. Uh, what about the people that have never heard the gospel and never had that opportunity? And Paul says, well, everybody's on the same page on this because everybody can look up at the sky, at the solar system, and see that we have a creator. We call that general revelation. Everybody's exposed to it. An external witness, we would say. Uh, and he says, in looking at creation, they can certainly come to the conclusion that it's by, by design, therefore it had a designer. And that designer then had to be greater than what we're looking at. So as we look at the universe, we know that God, the designer of the universe, has to be greater than everything that we see. We also see that uh, not only is everything moving in, as, pre, as a precise uh, mechanism uh, in the sky, uh, but the fact that uh, it's moving in what we call time and space. And therefore, we also know that God is not only greater, but he is eternal and lives outside it. If he created time, uh, he has to live outside of it and be greater than time itself. Everybody's got that same witness. Uh, the second thing you mentioned then is everybody has the internal witness of our own conscience. We looked at that, uh, uh, that last week. Everybody has a sense of morality in their mind, no matter where they are, whatever their environment, upbringing, anywhere on the planet. There's a couple of common denominators, like it's always wrong to kill innocent or murder innocent people and so forth. And we could go through a list of things that everybody feels the same way about. Where did they get that? Well, that came from God, that conscience, that sense of morality, an uh, in internal witness. So uh, again, what do you say to those people that say, what about the pygmies in Africa? The, then you say, everybody that, even if they've never heard the gospel, have those two witnesses, an external witness, the creation, even though there is attempts to suppress that truth, we live in those days, uh, and they have an internal witness in terms of the conscience. Then he kind of sense turns his guns, or his, uh, in a sense, on the, the religious person. Uh, and in here, he's certainly going to talk about the Jewish people. Paul's day in the first century, probably no more religious people on the planet uh, than the Jewish people. But everything he says applies to everybody uh, that is religious today. It doesn't matter if they're a Muslim, a Hindu, a Buddhist, whatever it is. Uh, religious people believe they do certain things to appease or address their relationship with their God or gods in order to attain a righteous place in them. They might even make certain sacrifices, believing that they have sin or sins that need to be atoned for. And whatever it is, they believe by their own achievements that uh, they are making themselves right before God. And we be, he really began this section last week, and remember I showed you the slide of uh, that uh, very talented athlete, the gal that uh, just swam from Molokai to uh, uh, Oahu just uh, a few weeks ago. 
And we said that if we went down to Kailua Beach with her, we're all going to go for a swim and swim as far as we could. We're going to try to get to California. She would get a lot farther, but nobody would make it. And uh, that's the condition we are in terms of people trying to earn their way or having a works righteousness mentality in terms of our relationship with God. And Christians are not immune from this. In fact, Christians and Christian history for the last 2,000 years have built entire systems by which you have to do certain things in order to be righteous with God. This is all foreign, of course, to Paul's teaching in the New Testament, everything that Jesus said to us in the gospel. But it is a concern for those around us that we know that are maybe consider themselves to be very religious but they don't have a relationship with Christ. Jesus says this in Matthew 7, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus says there won't be a few. It will be many that will come to me on that day. There will be many good moral people. There'll be many religious people. There'll be many people that actually did miracles and cast out demons and even spoke on behalf of God. And Jesus said to, to them, sorry, but I never knew you. They never really had a relationship uh, with him. And uh, we all can kind of create in our own minds a system by where we think our good outweighs the bad. But Paul says there's a false confidence in any, any kind of a religious system as we said, he's going to get to the point it's a matter of the heart. Well, in our outline, the first point is that the Jewish, or in this case we'd say also the religious person, has a false confidence, and that's in verse 17 to 24. Indeed, you who are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, do you teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. First thing he says that we'll note about the confidence level is that it's based on a sense of, of privilege. And, and again, just even reading this text, you can, you can imagine how shocking this would be uh, to the Jewish people hearing this in, in the first century or, or, or today. Some of the things that Paul's about, uh, about ready to say. Because there is a sense of privilege I mean, after all, if you're Jewish, the scripture says you're God's elect. Uh, you're his child. Uh, you are chosen among all the nations of the earth to be his special people. You are the apple or the pupil of his eye. His watch care for over you is continual. His eye is on your city, Jerusalem, always. I mean, we could go on and on. You get a sense that I think I'm in here <laughs> with, with, with God. And uh, I had a... It's, it's funny, even, in, uh, even among Christian circles, uh, we, we kind of have that, uh, that, that sense that somehow that maybe, uh, uh, maybe uh, Jewish people are like halfway saved or something because at least we're all worshiping the, the, the same God or whatever. Uh, and a lot of them thought a lot more than that. And Paul begins to kind of uh, uh, pick it apart here. Uh, in one sentence, we'd say he notes that the sense of privilege had six aspects. And the first one, well, the name. He says they were called or are called or bear the name Jews. And of course, uh, that name comes from the tribe of Judah, uh, which means to praise. Uh, we don't really see it appear until after, after the Assyrian captivity. Now, remember, Israel, once they were established as a nation, uh, it asked for a king. They got Saul, then they had David, then they had Solomon, and then they had Rehoboam. Jeroboam goes to the north, and the kingdom splits over taxes. A little issue there that uh, is close to all of our hearts these days. Uh, the, the nation splits over that, 
Uh, and then eventually the northern kingdoms, the ten tribes up there, go into this incredible idolatry. God sends lots of prophets, and they uh, never repent from that, and they go into the Assyrian captivity. During the uh, ensuing time that that was going on, uh, righteous Jews from all ten of the other tribes eventually come down into the, the south, uh, and they are living there in what's called Judah. The north was called Israel, sometimes Ephraim, the south, the larger tribe, Judah. And at that point on, they begin for the first time to be known uh, as Jews itself. Uh, the term is only uh, used 10 times in the Old Testament. Eight of it is during Esther, during the, during the captivity. Uh, the plural form is used 257 times. 75 of those are uh, are named uh, in the New Testament and most particularly in the, in the book of John. When it's used there, it's talking about the leadership uh, uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem in particular. But the point is, uh, Jews wore that as a badge of honor. In fact, during Paul's day, uh, if you were Jewish and you were living among a, a group of Gentiles, uh, you would actually add it on to your surname. Timothy C. Newman, Jew. Or Jewish, it would be right on you, uh, right on your uh, your door. They were uh, they were very very proud of it, very proud of the fact that they were uh, they were Jewish, uh, and we might say that therefore they felt a sense of entitlement. That's a, another term that uh, we're from more familiar with today. It means praise to Jehovah. Paul's point is, I don't think he's really getting any praise for what's going on. Secondly, because it leads to this, uh, this false confidence, they relied on the possession of the law or the Torah, uh, which they believed gave them a, a unique standing before the Lord. And certainly they did. I mean, they had the word of God. They had the Bible. They had the prophets. They had, they had the words uh, of Moses that explained everything from creation and all the law. Uh, all 10? No, all 613. Those are all the commandments. Uh, and, uh, and of course, they were very afraid uh, of breaking those 613. So then uh, their writers wrote another group of laws that they said was a hedge around those so that if they never broke these laws, they would certainly never have broken those. So it's not just enough to say, hey, on the Shabbat, on the day, on the Sabbath, we're all going to not work that day, day as we're instructed. We're going to tell you exactly what that means and, uh, and get very detailed about it. And then that wasn't enough. Then they wrote another set of commentaries to describe what this meant. So that... Uh, that uh, Ten Commandments, the 613, the Talmud, the Mishnah, this is getting pretty big. Lots of volumes of what it was because, you know, we want to honor God and we do and we keep these things. And there's a self-confidence uh, that's growing in this that has nothing to do with the relationship with the Lord. Paul's a unique guy to, to uh, basically deal with this issue being a Pharisee himself, having studied with Gamaliel. He says this in Philippians 3 concerning his own pedigree, in a sense, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Paul says, uh, uh, you want to put your Jewishness up against mine? I'll do that any day. And, uh, and uh, you'll see that I'm actually, again, it was a big deal to be a Pharisee. Not only a Pharisee, he would say in another place, and I exceeded above the level of my own contemporaries or my own peers in terms of who he was uh, as a rabbi and so forth. Many believing, sitting on the their supreme court of the day, or the Sanhedrin itself, because he's there holding the robes as they're stoning Stephen, the first martyr of the church. Paul says, oh, whatever you think you got going in terms of your religiosity, let me tell you who I was. And by the way, I counted as loss, as nothing compared to a relationship with Jesus Christ. One uh, David Hawking said uh, about the danger is that personal claims to be righteous are hypocritical if they are not backed up by a godly lifestyle. And of course, that's the problem. That's what Paul addresses here uh, in our text. Three, they bragged about regarding God. So, well, that's not such a bad thing. I wish we all bragged a lot more about God. 
uh, you know, who he was, his grace, his love, what he's done for us. I think we should be uh, habitually bragging, bragging about God. It should be our desire to make God famous uh, in Kailua and uh, whatever community that, uh, that we're in because of what we say and how we live our life about him. But there was their problem. Uh, their bragging about God wasn't so much about God. It was about who they were in terms of being Jewish uh, and, uh, and his selecting them uh, as, their special, as his special nation uh, and how that gave them privilege and so forth. That led to the fourth thing. They prided themselves on knowing the revealed will of God. They had the Ten Commandments. They had the Scriptures. They knew what the will of God is. See, today you can just buy Strat's book, and then you'll know that. But uh, <laughs> they, they prided these, themselves in these things. Fifth, they discerned the things that were essential. That is, they can make superior moral judgments. Uh, and they did. And they let their Gentile friends, if they had anyone know about it on a regular basis. They didn't refer to Gentiles as Gentile dogs for, for nothing because they were the ones that had the covenants, that had the promises, that had the priests, that had the temple, that had the worship, that had a relationship with God that could give moral judgments upon others. And again, Paul addressed that last week when he said, stop judging uh, other people. Six, they were instructed uh, from the law. So the law was meant to be a light unto their feet, uh, and certainly these were privileges, but they had a deluding effect uh, upon them uh, because they believed that having them made them acceptable to God. Having that, that Bible under their arm made them acceptable to God. Luther, in, uh, in his day, and I'll give you the contemporary version of it in a minute, but Luther in his day used to say that, that uh, if someone could, uh, could get to get to heaven simply by going to church, then there's going to be lots of dogs in heaven. I know that's the thing you've been concerned about, because in Luther's day, you know, there was, you know, it was, uh, it was always a shady place on the big front porch, and apparently that's where the dogs like to hang out in the heat of the day. So they were there a lot more than any, any people. They probably shoot them away on Sundays, but they were there the rest of the time uh, in the town or in, or in the village. So he said, if going to church uh, could uh, get you into heaven, there'll be a lot of dogs in heaven. And then he says, if good works could get you to heaven, then there'll also be a lot of mules in heaven, because nobody works like a mule, of course, in that day that was uh, out plowing the fields. They worked harder than anybody else. So if good works could get you to heaven, there'll be a lot of mules, there'll be a lot of dogs in, in heaven. Of course, you know, going to church, good works can't get you there. That's part of what Paul is saying here. Keith Green put it this way in our contemporary language. He said that if that if going to church uh, could get you to heaven, then going to McDonald's will make you a hamburger. But uh, famous Keith Green line, of course, none of those true, and uh, we don't really have the application here. But in California, they would say, if, uh, uh, then if uh, going to Winchell, Winchell's Donuts, then would make you a highway patrolman, but, uh, <laughs> because they're, they seem to spend a lot of time there. But uh, it's not enough. That's not what makes you acceptable uh, to God. Paul says they rested on the law, and they make their boast in God. They say they know his will. They approve of things that are excellent, and they're instructed out of the law. It brought a false confidence. Secondly, their false confidence is based on their abilities. Again, the sense of entitlement led to uh, the deadly sin uh, of pride described there in verses 19 uh, and 20. Uh, they believed that they were a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, instructors of the foolish and teachers of babes. Why did they believe that? They were taught that <laughs> over and over and over again. So Paul's not just pulling these, these phrases out of thin air. This is what all, all Jewish people, uh, especially the, the men uh, going to their uh, uh, schools every day growing up, that they learned that they were to be a guide to the blind. Of course, it was Jesus that said to the Pharisee, the leaders of their religious life, in fact, you are blind yourself and you're leading others. You are, in fact, not a guide to the blind, but you are blinded guides. Uh, in Isaiah, uh, a passage that we'll be reading on Christmas cards perhaps shortly, makes reference to the failure that they had in terms of being even a light to those in darkness. Isaiah 49, 6 says, indeed he says, uh, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob? and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. 
I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. A light to the Gentiles. How were they doing that in Paul's day? They weren't doing real well, actually. Uh, they were so <laughs> disgusted being around the Gentiles that when they entered Israel again, they would shake all of their robes to get that Gentile dust <laughs> off of them before they actually came back into the land. They weren't doing real good at carrying out. What were they to be a light of? That the Messiah was coming. The one who would bless every person on the earth if they would simply turn to him. Uh, and of course, that is Jesus Christ. One writer said that prideful presumption upon religious privilege can breed a self-righteous, self-centered, and self-deceived person. And again, Paul's example here, appropriately, is the Jewish person in the first century, uh, but this could be said of uh, any religious person uh, and, uh, and from any, any background. Uh, Jesus, again, addresses this in Luke's gospel in chapter 18, verse 19, where he compares one of these religious leaders with a tax collector. There he says, uh, verse 9, also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves, and that they were righteous. That's the, Paul, uh, the problem Paul is addressing. What else did they do? And despised others. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is not only true of, uh, of Jews or any other religious person. It's certainly true of Christians as well. If you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. But if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. Peter tells us that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I don't know about you. I need all the grace I can get. Uh, and there's a real danger here. I think the danger is, is not being a new believer in Jesus Christ, because at that point, you're just so thankful. God has accepted you. God has saved you. Uh, you're beginning to learn his word and uh, grow in your relationship with him. And it's all so great and so exciting. I think the danger is, once you've walked with the Lord for a while, his spirit brings about some change. You, he gives you a hunger and thirst for the word. You're beginning to read the Bible. You're miser memorizing some scripture. Uh, you might even begin to do some ministry. You might even even lead a few people to the Lord. Hey, you're looking pretty good. God changes your whole life and lifestyle around. And now you've reached a point where you can look down <laughs> on the rest of those that are not saved like you are. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's something to certainly to be, be concerned about. We, we've got a whole whole traditions uh, built within church systems that, that actually even foster and uh, are able to do that. Of course, within the Pentecostal circles, if, if you don't speak in tongues, well, you're not as spiritual as the person that does. In fact, if you don't in some circles, it's because you're not actually saved, because God gave somebody a gift he didn't give to you. You know, you have it certainly within the, uh, the traditions of, uh, of other churches, you know. And, you know, did you take your first Holy Communion? You know, were you baptized in the church? Were you this? Were you this? Were you this? Well, no, I was. I'm a member of this. I'm a member of this group. It's, uh, it should be a concern for all of us. This confidence that has nothing to do with our relationship with the Lord. Third, they should have, they, Paul says, they should have no confidence at all. Verse 21, you therefore who teach another, do you teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking uh, the law? And of course, many of the Jewish leaders were guilty of these very things. It was common knowledge. Paul's not like, uh, you know, pull, again, pulling this out of thin air. Uh, the Talmud itself charged three of its most illustrious rabbis with uh, adultery. Uh, and again, there's a problem when our talk doesn't match our walk. And that's uh, Paul's concern here. <clears throat> Notice what he says about them. 
they're meant to be instructors, but yet they weren't teachable themselves. That's always a danger. When you reach a point maybe in your maturity in Christ where you're no longer teach, teachable. You should be, you, you, we need to always be teachable. Uh, one of the um, qualifications to be, even be a leader in the church is that, uh, that you should be able to teach. But th- that also means teachable. I remember a number of years ago, we were having one of our retreats out on the North Shore as we, for the guys that we do every year there in February. And uh, uh, we actually, you know, these days we just kind of have the, the guys locally, uh, you know, do the teaching. It's a lot, it's a lot easier logistically and, uh, and so forth. But the first couple, we'd bring guys from the mainland. We had some, man, we had some great, great guys come over, David Hogg and Gail Irwin and uh, Don McClure, a bunch of other guys that were from Southern California that were just really great teachers. And I remember saying to one of the guys in the church that was, you know, pretty plugged in, I thought, and everything. And uh, I noticed he hadn't signed up to go. And, you know, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't finances. It wasn't anything I could help out with. And, hey, I noticed you're not signed up. You're not going. And, uh, and everything. Yeah, it's a great opportunity. You know, so and so is going to be with her. Man, he's such a good Bible teacher. You know, he's one of Chuck's first associate pastors and got this history of Calvary Chapel. It's, it's going to be a great time. I just can't really learn in that kind of situation. Oh, what's it? You know, the lecture thing. And I don't really get that. I'm more of an interactive type of person myself. Okay, let me get this straight. We got one of the best Bible teachers on the planet coming over here, and you don't think you can learn from him. I didn't really say that, but uh, I was trying to get him out there. But uh, it was kind of shocking to me. But people can fall into that, where they're no longer teachable uh, from the Word of God. That was one of their problems Paul is pointing out. Secondly, they disobeyed what God forbid. Uh, You know, the Scriptures are pretty clear. Don't steal. Uh, And yet uh, it uh, it was concern. Every prophet of God in the Old Testament, when he exhorted the people of God, one of the things he exhorted them for was stealing. If you go back, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, it's always one of the issues. Uh, he says, are you, you say don't commit adultery, but are you committing adultery? This is mean, uh, being unfaithful. Uh, and certainly Jesus said, if it even occurs in your mind, it's as if you've done it. Robbing temples. Man, are you sure they were robbing temples? That's what Malachi says, Malachi 3.8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? You are accursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to to receive it. And certainly that can go on today. I think, uh, you know, we, we certainly miss a blessing. I love what uh, Governor Huckabee said on uh, one of his uh, weekend shows uh, a number of weeks ago when he was uh, addressing the, uh, this, this issue. It's kind of nice when you got a pastor that's got a national show and deals with Christian issues, but uh, he was talking about the issue of, uh, of tithing. Uh, and he said, you know, we've, uh, my wife and I have learned over the last, you know, whatever it was, 30, 40 years that uh, we're, we're always better off with 90% of our money and God's blessing than 100% and not God's blessing. I thought that was a pretty succinct statement about the whole thing. Uh, but it was an issue uh, here with these guys. I think it's an issue with not all, but some TV evangelists who basically their primary mission is to get money. <laughs> they don't really pastor a church anywhere. They don't really have a, a ministry. They're not really on the mission field. They're just on TV. And what's their purpose for being on TV? It's to get your money. So send in that $100, and we'll send you the anointed handkerchief. I don't know why I do it in an accent, but uh, the, uh, it's, they all have a strange accent. I, I don't know what it is. I guess none of these guys come from California or Hawaii or something. But anyway, they, uh, uh, where people talk regular, but... Uh, that's because I live in Hawaii and I'm from California. Sorry. The, uh, it's interesting. I have this little uh, dictation thing where I can dictate and it just kind of listens to my voice and types it out. It's, I like it. And, uh, <laughs> but it, but it, as it analyzes your voice, it, it tells you what part of the country you're from. It says I'm from the South. I, <laughs> which I am, but I just, I just didn't know this little machine could figure that out. You know, I don't... What is, which one of those words am I saying? But anyway, uh, uh, it's interesting. These guys, that had nothing to do with the message, by the way. These guys are on TV, 
And maybe they speak wonderfully, many of them. But uh, their whole thing is to get money from people. Uh, and, uh, and they're robbing God. And they're robbing God's people when they do that. These things are still going on. And Paul says in his kind of cross-examination at the end, as it is written, verse 24, for the name of God is blaspheme among the Gentiles uh, because of you. The very people that are supposed to be the witness of God to the rest of the world, a light to the Gentiles because their walk did not match their talk, were actually uh, causing God's name to be blasphemed. We mentioned David and Bathsheba last week, and of course Nathan the prophet, one of the things he said to to David is, by doing this, you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt. So there's a danger, whether you're Jewish or just religious, uh, if you have a false confidence. You can have a false confidence because of a sense of privilege or entitlement. It's based on your own abilities. And Paul says you should have no, no confidence at all. Uh, that leads to the second paragraph. Point two, a religious ceremony is not what matters. That's in verse 25 to 20, 29. And there is no ceremony like circumcision that the Jewish people had more confidence in. And that's, I think, why Paul deals with it as an illustration. Verse 25, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision or to no effect. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man, a Gentile, keeps the righteous requirements of the law, not that he could, but you know, just for the sake of argument, let's say that he could, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor a circumcision that is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. First thing about this religious ceremony is that uh, it doesn't really matter if you live in disobedience. I mean, what, what use is it, uh, Paul, uh, Paul is saying? And it, and it is a big deal. It is a big deal. It was almost a big deal to all of us. Uh, back in Acts chapter 15, and we... Uh, we mentioned uh, this on Wednesday nights in our study of Amos because uh, it's, it's a quote from Amos that kind of settles the issue when James stands up and kind of puts an end to how do we deal with the issue of Gentiles coming into the church. Church is primarily uh, Jewish. Uh, and this guy, uh, uh, Paul, messes it all up uh, by going out and preaching the gospel to Gentiles and they start getting, getting saved. Uh, and they don't know what to do about that because after all, you've got uh, in the church there in Jerusalem, you got priests that are saved. you got Pharisees that are saved. You see why they'd have just like a little bit of a legalistic bent, having grown up as a priest or a Pharisee. Uh, they're in the church. They've been saved. Thousands, thousands have been saved uh, in the church in Jerusalem. Uh, they're kind of upset because uh, they waited in line for a couple thousand years for the Messiah to come. And they've been waiting, they've been waiting, and they had to do a bunch of stuff. They had to be circumcised on the eighth day. They had to keep the Shabbat. They had to keep all the... Well, they're waiting. And then the Messiah, Jesus, finally comes, dies for the sins, and all the Gentiles just like cut in line. Just like, just cut right in line. Do you like that when people do that? You're waiting for like an hour and a half, you know, there to get in line at the airport, and some guy, do, do you say stuff? Yeah, it's, it's all like, my wife will usually hold my hand a little tighter, because she knows I'm going to say something. And I know what she's saying by squeezing my hand a little right at that juncture. But... Uh, <laughs> So I try to, you know, kind of make some noise. That way I'm not really saying anything, you know. I'm just like, what's up with this? Well, that, well what if you stood in line for 2,000 years? And then these guys start jumping in line. And they hadn't done any of the stuff you did. You're a little upset. So they're trying to figure out what to do about this. And then you've got, uh, so Peter tells, well, I, you know, I couldn't, you know, it's just what God called me to do. It's just happening. And then Peter, you know, very reluctantly, if you read it, Peter's like, yeah, well, you know, I was over in Simon the Tanner's house. It's right on the beach. I kind of suspect maybe surfs or something because Peter stays there. If you're kosher, you don't stay with a guy's house that handles dead animals, you know, but maybe there's a break right there. I don't know. I'm just saying. I don't know. But he stays with Simon the Tanner. God gives him the vision because Peter's a guy, so God's got to tell him like three times, you know, uh, you know, this whole thing, what I've made clean, don't call unclean. He's not talking about food. He's talking about people. Uh, all that is to get to Peter to go out to preach at Cornelius' house. 
uh, he goes out there. He doesn't even want to go in the guy's yard. It's not because he's got pit bulls. Uh, it's just because he's Gentile. He doesn't want to go, go in. And, uh, and then he, you know, he does. But he's not going to do it alone. He takes some other guys with him because he's kind of suspecting maybe God's going to do something. And he doesn't want to get blamed for this whole thing. So he takes some other folks in with him, some of the other Jewish brothers. He pre- preaches the gospel. The Holy Spirit comes down. They all get saved. And just kind of confirm to make sure nobody's making this up. Uh, they all speak in tongues the same way that uh, Peter and the boys did on the day of Pentecost. So he's there. So he gives his whole deal. And it's like, don't blame me. And I got a couple witnesses. So it just happened. Uh, so they're trying to fit. So James finally stands up. James is like the leader of the church in Jerusalem. James, the half brother of Jesus. Uh, and he goes, okay, this is what we're going to do. And then he quotes Amos. If he doesn't quote Amos, and that's our point on Wednesday, if he doesn't quote Amos to settle this deal with Scripture, you're calling me rabbi, and uh, uh, you guys are all getting a little surgery when you come to faith in Christ. So hallelujah, they had the Acts 15 council, and they said that uh, we're going to accept the Gentiles in, uh, and they don't have to go through this, uh, this ceremony, because it was a huge, it was a big deal. Uh, listen to, the, to the, uh, this whole situation in Genesis 17 when it's introduced as the sign of the covenant, sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Again, Noah uh, gets a, a sign for that covenant. What was the sign of the covenant for Noah? It's a, it's a rainbow, right? And when God tells Abraham, I'm going to give you a sign to go along with the covenant. Sarah, getting the sign, covenant. Noah, the rainbow, maybe a star or something. Something really good, going to tell me in the morning. I don't think it turned out the way, you know, the way he was thinking, you know, based on the other, the, the rainbow thing. Uh, but here it is. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me, uh, you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign. There it is, a sign of the covenant between me and you. Uh, He was uh, eight days old. Among you shall be circumcised every male in your generations. He who was born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is uh, not your descendant, he who was born in your house and he who was bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for uh, how long? An everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male, it's like, what if we don't do it? And any uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Wow. Well, that's pretty heavy. What happens if you don't do it? Well, he's cut off. No chance. So it's a big deal. Uh, uh, the Jews at that time believed that uh, if you were male, you were circumcised on the eighth day, you're going to heaven. It doesn't really matter what your life like. You're going to heaven. That's, that's, that's just the deal. Uh, one rabbi, Rabbi uh, Medakam, in his commentary on the book of Moses, write, Our rabbis have said that no uncircumcised, uh, no circumcised man will see hell. Another commentary said circumcision saves from hell. The Midrash says that God swore to Abraham that no one who was circumcised should be sent to hell. You see why Paul picks this? Uh, talking about having confidence in something in a religious ceremony they had confidence in a religious ceremony is this an issue today i know people that were infant baptized they think they're going to heaven because they were baptized in and i got other people that are very afraid because their children weren't baptized as infants and they don't think they can go to heaven now because of a tradition that's not even in the bible it's just a tradition we get very hung up on religious ceremonies. Uh, what this was all about, it, of course, it had, it had nothing to do <coughs> with the kids or the faith of the kids. There's no kid eight days old saying, think I'd like to obey the law now. This, you know, it's not happening. It's the parents. It's the parents saying, we believe in the Abrahamic covenant. We believe that, that God says he will bless us. Uh, uh, by those that, that, that those that bless us will be blessed, those that curse us will be cursed. We believe he's given us the land, and we believe that one of the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, one person, one man board, would have the ability to bless every person on the planet. That's what it says. We call him the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And we believe that, so we're going to do this. That's what the parents are saying. That's a cool thing. This is a beautiful thing. It's just that it couldn't help them. You know, we do another covenant, it's called marriage. When I do a wedding ceremony, <clears throat> usually at the beginning I have a little scripture I read for the guys, 
read a couple of scriptures from Proverbs 31 for the, uh, for the gals. And then I say, are you ready to enter the covenant of marriage? And then they holding hands and face me and they both say, we are. And, uh, uh, and then I say, have you brought rings to seal the covenant? Rings are the sign of the covenant that they are, are entering. And we do the whole, I talk about the rings and we do the whole ring deal. They put those rings on, we finish the ceremony. Does that keep either of them from ever committing adultery? No, it, it's just a symbol. It's a beautiful symbol. But, but it doesn't help you. Circumcision was a beautiful statement of faith by the parents. But it doesn't help you. It doesn't get you into heaven. There's no ceremony that gets you into heaven. It doesn't matter what it is. Christian, Jew, Hindu, whatever it is. There's no ceremony, that's Paul's point, that can get you into heaven. This was a, a big deal. He mentions it again in chapter 4 and verse 11. He says of uh, Abraham, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe that though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Everybody by faith gets imputed righteousness to us because we like the faith of Abraham. It has nothing to do with a particular religious ceremony. Is that an issue sometimes in sharing your faith? Yeah, I, I, I think it is. You, you, know, I, you, know, you know, I'm a religious person. You know, I've already heard that. You know, uh, and, and, and you kind of get this, this whole thing. Paul even comes back and says, you know, I'm not saying a Gentile could keep the law. Let's say he could for argument's sake. That would make him more righteous than you, wouldn't it? Since you can't keep it. Uh, which had to, uh, there's certainly, uh, we're not getting it. There had to be some real shock value with what he's saying to uh, uh, Jewish ears if, if you're hearing this. Uh, the sign, the ceremony uh, is nothing apart from faith uh, in Christ. Paul then kind of logically turns the coin on its head in verse 26. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, even with the written code and circumcision, as a transgressor uh, of, of the law? And of course, uh, one of the greatest insults in Judaism was to call another Jew uncircumcised. And that's what Paul just, just did here, and on no, on no uncertain terms. Secondly, he says, a religious ceremony by itself, again, is not an indication of a person's relationship uh, with God. Neither is baptism, neither is church membership, neither is confirmation, neither is your first Holy Communion, neither if you're a Methobacterian or whatever, whatever denomination you might, you might be from. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. You say to someone, so uh, are, you, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Well, I'm a member of the first church of so-and-so, and I've been there 25 years. I, I don't think that's really what I asked. But, uh, but that's the, you get those responses. Are you a believer? I'm Roman Catholic. So was my parents and their parents before me. That kind of settles it, doesn't it? Not exactly. Not exactly. This is the answer. It's that Paul's trying to help us with uh, these kind of people. And uh, are you a believer? I was baptized right here in this very church. We don't have a baptistry. Well, I was down at the beach, you know. Uh, no, that doesn't quite get it. Of course, and, and I've come across this, uh, you know, when, you, when you're trying to share and then you, you meet somebody that is Jewish. Uh, are, you, are you a believer uh, in Jesus? You know, do you have a relationship with the Lord? I'm Jewish. That settles it. You have nothing to say to me. Well, that's, that's not exactly answering the question either. Uh, but uh, these are the issues we deal with in trying to share our faith. Paul's point is there is no re religious ceremony. There is none. But it doesn't exist uh, that can save uh, anybody. Uh, so he says, thirdly, a religious ceremony by itself is not a substitute for a changed heart because that's where he's going. It's all about the heart. Uh, Judaism was very external. Uh, and it, uh, it, it teaches us so much. And, of course, this is going to lead to this rhetorical question that we'll look at next week in chapter 3. So what advantage is there in being a Jew? Paul says, that's a good question. Let me answer that. And he'll go through it. 
but it still leads to the same conclusion. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I like uh, Dr. Barnhouse. Donald Barnhouse uh, translates this passage uh, uh, in a Christian context, and he says, puts it this way, For he is not a Christian who is one outwardly, nor is that church membership which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Christian who is one inwardly. And church membership is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but of from God. It's easy to be self-deceived because we're familiar with the truth or we've got some religious uh, affiliation. I want to close with just a couple of passages of Scripture. And one is from Ezekiel that kind of deals with, with this whole issue of people that show up, it sounds good, it looks good, but they're not really saved, kind of like uh, Jesus' concern in Matthew 7. Uh, in Ezekiel thirty three thirty, it says, As for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you besides the walls, and in the doors of the houses, and they speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, please come and hear what the, uh, the word is that comes from the Lord. All right, Ezekiel, that sounds pretty good. Everybody wants to come hear you, man, hear what, what you've got, you got to say. Uh, in the verse 31, he goes on, so they come to you as people do. Uh, they sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them, for with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. In other words, they're sitting there listening to Ezekiel. Oh, I just love this. Praise the Lord. So good to be in the house of God. Man, what's my 401k doing? Do you see the stock market lately? Man, I could get laid off here in a couple. That's, that's the idea of pursuing gain. They're worried about what's going on financially, material, materially in their life uh, the whole time, which leads to verse 32. Indeed, uh, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on the instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. There's a, there's a, there's, they're gonna, there's a lot that can look really good on the outside and even sound really good. Oh, I just love this. Praise the Lord. Uh, there's something wrong uh, in the heart. They do not do them. Uh, the problem is the heart. That was the point of circumcision all along. Uh, Moses in Deuteronomy 36 says, And the Lord your God will circumcise, notice your heart, and the heart of your descendants. Why? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Jeremiah the prophet says this in Jeremiah 4.4, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts. Paul even mentions this whole concept uh, uh, in Colossians 2.9. He makes this wonderful statement about the deity of Christ first. The speaking of Christ, he says, for, for him, Christ dwells, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Why do we need to be circumcised in our hearts? Because we've got a lot of scar tissue there, that's why. Sin does a real number on us. And a ceremony won't save us, and it won't help us either. It might occupy some time, make you feel better about yourselves in some way because you've done some religious deal for the week. But the problem is, is the heart condition. And our hearts need to be circumcised. That is, that sin needs to be uh, dealt with. And uh, the problem is, is that true salvation is a matter of the heart and not that of religion. Sometimes we'll, you know, it's used a lot, but we'll say that religion is man's attempt to reach up to God, but Christianity is God's attempt to reach down, down to man. Paul says, everybody has sinned, all are under condemnation, and everybody's without excuse. It doesn't matter if you're non-religious. It doesn't even matter if you're a religious Jew in the first century going to the temple and doing your sacrifices because that's still there. It hasn't been destroyed yet. It would be soon uh, after this. The most religious person you could think of, uh, it still doesn't matter. It's always a condition of the heart. Paul mentions this in the Great Confession in Romans 10, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth uh, that Jesus the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God, again, it's believing in the heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, 
not that of works, so that no one can boast. Notice that line about, are you going for the praise of men or the praise of God? We want to live for the praise of God. It's a matter of the heart. We all need to turn and receive Christ. There just is no other way, according to the Apostle Paul. Well, let's pray. Lord, as we uh, consider this message and uh, begin to consider uh, taking communion together this morning and examine the elements of the bread and the matzah as well as the, the cup representing your body and your blood poured out for us, Lord. Pray that it's a good time for us to think about our own lives, Lord. We recognize that you oppose the proud but give grace to the humble. We pray that we constantly be humbling ourselves before you and recognize that, um, Lord, we want to do good things for you in response to your love and your mercy, but uh, our good works can, can never save us. There's not a religious ceremony. Lord, there's people all around us possibly that believe that they've done a religious ceremony and somehow their good works will outweigh their bad works and it's just simply not true. Lord, maybe during this time, this holiday season, thinking there are more people are thinking about you, pray that you give us the opportunity to share this message of your love and your grace because everybody needs to hear it. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.